how to find out how inbred someone is. Those of you who know my channel will know that I specialise on exposing the messy genealogies of families past and present, ranging from the common to the royal. For a while now, I've wanted to create a video which can be the linchpin of the findings for this channel, in which I document the process I go through in order to determine how inbred someone or a historical family truly is. This is how I found out how inbred King Charles is and how many inbred royals throughout history there have been. And so today's video will serve as your key document in finding out how inbred someone is. Before we officially commence with the video, let me explain the video's tripartite structure. The first segment of this video investigates the consanguinity coefficient, which is the calculation to determine how inbred someone is. The second section of the video applies this finding to people in history who have severe effects of inbreeding while having a high consanguinity coefficient. In particular, we'll be looking at a case study, the Habsburgs. The third and final section of this video will perhaps be the most interesting. This will reveal individuals in history who displayed critically high consanguinity coefficients, yet lived, relatively speaking, healthy lives. This will uncover how inbreeding is simply a genetic lottery, although important. As always, make sure to leave a like, comment or subscribe if you enjoy today's content. And without further ado, let's move on to the video. Fortunately, it's not that difficult to accurately work out how inbred someone is. This is because we have a handy thing known as the consanguinity coefficient. This simply means how inbred someone is. There are two components to the consanguinity coefficient. First is the coefficient of relationship. This is specific to an individual. The second component is the kinship coefficient, which works out the relatedness of someone due to their ancestry. We're going to be using this component for the theory as it takes into account the relationship of the parents and their ancestors. Let me now break down this table, which you can find online to explain how different pairings would produce different levels of inbreeding. Firstly, the consanguinity coefficient is on a scale between 0, 0%, 0 which is the least inbred, up to 1, 100%, which is the most inbred. This is interesting since it's virtually impossible to have an inbred level of anything higher than 0.5, 50%. In fact, there have been virtually no historical figures who have had this level of inbreeding or higher. Let's now break down our chart, which provides examples of potential parent relationships. Firstly, if someone was to have a child with themselves, impossible, I know, their child would have a consanguinity of 0.5, 50% which is incredibly high. However, this has been included for the simple reason that if two identical twins were to have a child, their child would also have a consanguinity coefficient of 0.5, 50%, since their DNA is so closely matched, almost as if they were the same person. Moving back to our chart, we can see other examples of parent relationships which can cause inbreeding. If two full siblings were to have a child, their child would have an inbreeding level of 0.25, 25%. Same as if a parent and child were to have their own child. An avunculate marriage, which unfortunately was popular to many royal families in history, is when an uncle marries his niece or an aunt marries her nephew. And this would cause an inbreeding level of 0.125, 12.5%. Finally, the only other important consideration would be first cousin marriages, which create an inbreeding level of 0.0675 or 6.75%. This moves on to a little criticism of this chart. This only takes into account the parents and not their parents and so on. Inbreeding level is a cumulative effect, meaning it accounts the inbreeding level of the ancestors, the child's parents, whether they're related or not, and whether that would then affect the child if they would have a lower or a higher inbreeding level than their own parents. If that was a bit confusing, let me use an example to make this clearer. Let's say parent A had an inbreeding level of 0.0675 because their parents were first cousins. Parent B has been lucky enough to not have any inbreeding. If the parents were not related, 
then their child's inbreeding would be halfway between their parents' inbreeding level. So in this case, halfway between 0 and 6.75 would roughly be 3.4. So the child would have an inbreeding level of roughly 0 0.034 or 3.4%. However, if parent A and B were first cousins, then something different would occur. Instead, the inbreeding level would increase for the child. It would take the 6.75%, which is the first cousin relationship, and apply this to their parents' inbreeding. In this case, it would again be halfway between their parents' relationship, but you then need to add the 6.75% because of the first cousin relationship. This means the child would have over 10% inbreeding. It's because of this stacking effect that is responsible for the premature deaths of various royal families in history, since they continue to intermarry over numerous generations. Let's look at the infamous Habsburg dynasty, notably the Spanish royal family in the 15 and 1600s. As we can see from their faces, but also through this diagram of the family tree, we can track the cumulative inbreeding of the royal family. It started with the marriage of, well, multiple members of the same family. Maria of Spain married her first cousin, only for their slightly inbred daughter to marry her own uncle resulting in the inbred Philip III of Spain. At the same time, the other branch of the family in Austria were busy doing the same inbreeding. Maria Anna of Bavaria, this creature with the inbred lips, married her first cousin, producing the inbred Ferdinand III of Austria. Philip III of Spain's inbred daughter, unfortunately, was married off to the inbred Ferdinand III of Austria, so this was a first cousin marriage. Their children were among the most inbred in Europe at the time, yet the Habsburgs continued their messing inbreeding crest. Mariana of Austria, the daughter of Ferdinand III of Austria, was shipped off to Spain to marry her own uncle, which led to the birth of one of the most infamous inbred people to have ever lived in history, Charles II of Spain. What I'll do now is provide the inbreeding level as in the consanguinity coefficient of all of the aforementioned historical figures within the family tree. So you can see how, as inbred people intermarried with other inbred people, their descendants would suffer a cumulative rise in inbreeding. Unfortunately, this led to Charles II of Spain having, at the time, the highest consanguinity coefficient of any known person in Europe at 0.254 or 25%. This might not seem that high, but remember, if two full siblings were to have a child, their child would have an inbreeding level of 0.25. So Charles II of Spain was more inbred than the child of two full siblings. Yikes. His doctors confirmed later that his ancestry was responsible for the inability to secure the succession. However, the consanguinity coefficient does not always work, at least in the case of inbred people going on to have relatively healthy lives. There are two people in history that I will now discuss who were incredibly inbred, yet were extremely high functioning. Our first example is Margarita Teresa of Spain, who was the full sister to Charles II of Spain. Because they were full siblings, Margarita too had an inbreeding level higher than a child of two full siblings, as she had the exact same level of inbreeding as Charles II. However, unlike her brother Charles, she was able to go on and have numerous children, well, despite her marrying her own uncle. The Habsburgs seriously liked to keep it in the family. Another exception to the rule is perhaps the most inbred person known to history, Cleopatra. Most people already know the vast accomplishments of Cleopatra some 2,000 years ago, However, most people are unaware of just how inbred she was. This is because her family, the Ptolemaic dynasty, followed the ancient Egyptian tradition of divine marriage, in which royal family members were encouraged to marry one another in order to keep the bloodline pure. Because of this, Cleopatra's parents were full siblings, and not even that, Cleopatra only had three unique great-grandparents, whereas most people, myself and you included, would likely have eight unique great-grandparents. As always, my name is the Shy Historian and stay tuned for many more.